Few countries enjoy Morocco's exceptional geographic situation. As it is located on the edges of two seas and two continents. It is the occident of the Muslim world, hence its Arabic name of Al Maghrib Al Aqsa, which means the land of the setting sun. Simultaneously Mediterranean, Atlantic, Saharan, and Oriental, Morocco has been populated by a mosaic of people and cultures that all contributed to defining its identity. Going back to antiquity, and because of its strategic position, this land and its early Berber settlers were always in the sphere of influence of the great Mediterranean civilizations, such as the Phoenicians, Carthaginians, Romans, Byzantines, and Arabs. Morocco. Today, the name evokes the famous Sharifian palaces, surrounded by sumptuous gardens, the colorful and scented souks, the fascinating snake charmers, or the fantasia and its dazzling rituals. Concealed behind this somewhat prosaic facade are other lesser known treasures. Use the knocker properly and the doors open and invite you to discover an ancestral know-how sealed by the alliance between tradition and future. Who are the Moroccans? People often think they're Arabs. However, the Arabs of Muslim confession only arrived from Arabia after the 7th century, and they only represent one-third of the population. What people then constitute the remaining two-thirds? Those we now call Berbers, a name derived from the word barbarus, given by Rome to designate the non-Romanized populations in North Africa. This community originated between the 8th and the 3rd millennia. It stems from a descent of mixed people composed of a new type of individuals originally from Tunisia and a black population from the dry Sahara Desert. During the first half of the first millennium, the Berbers gradually split up in a multitude of tribes that were often rivals. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Phoenicians and Carthaginians founded trading posts at the outlets of North African commercial routes. At the end of the third century BC, several attempts to unify the Berber tribes gave birth to the first Moorish kingdoms, which continued to develop until their annexation by Rome in the year 40 BC. In the following centuries, the region would become the imperial province of Mauritania Tingitana, a North African Roman enclave. However, the Roman dominance did not result in the total assimilation of the Berber culture, as the latter rose up repeatedly and sometimes durably against the occupant. The fall of the Roman Empire a few centuries later and the subsequent Vandal and Byzantine invasions mark the end of this long period of the antiquity, during which the Berbers broadened their culture through the various influences that permeated their territory. I would say that the Moroccan civilization, and even the Moroccan culture in general, is a mosaic of several cultures that was inspired by many influences. First there was the Mauritanian civilization, followed by the Roman civilization. And it's true that in terms of permanence, I think there's a genuine one in all of the activities, because these civilizations not only left a mark in Morocco, but in pretty much all of the Mediterranean basin.
Other aspects of this permanence are also visible with regard to agriculture. For example, the use of the plough or the use of seeds. The agricultural produce has of course evolved, but this is nevertheless the same produce that existed in Roman times or during the Mauritanian era, for instance wheat, beans and grapes. People have continued to use these types of produce to this day. In Volubilis, we're lucky enough to witness this transition between the Roman period and the Islamic period. In the 7th century, the Roman city welcomed an Arab Sharif in exile from Damascus. The country's most famous holy place is named after this Sharif, Moulay Idris. He was the founder of Morocco and its first two capitals, Volubilis and then Fez. With the Arab conquest, the fate of the country was sealed for good. The Latin and Christian influences dwindled in favor of the Arab Muslim civilization. By imposing itself on the conquered populations, Islam and its rare power of conviction then enabled the dawn of a community culture and federating state. From then on, the country's history became closely tied to that of the six dynasties that would succeed each other uninterruptedly for the next 1,300 years. These comprised on one hand of the Idrisid, Sardinian and Aluit Sharafinian dynasties, all descending from the prophet Muhammad, and on the other hand, the powerful Berber aristocracies that converted to Islam, namely the Almoravid, Almohad and Marinad dynasties. Together, and to the glory of Allah, they generated a culture, architecture, arts and crafts, and a way of life that were both authentic and specific. The big cities of Fez, Marrakesh, Rabat, and Meknes, in turn became the political and cultural heart of Morocco, alternating as capitals of the Sharifian Empire on the whim of the dynasty leaders. In the 15th century, the repeated incursions by the Portuguese and the Spanish started to sound the death knell of the empire. Its gradual decline ensued, leading to the occupation of the country by France. The protectorate, initially signed in 1912, ended in 1956 with the proclamation of independence at the instigation of Mohammed V. Having avoided the Turkish hegemony, Morocco was only under colonial domination for four decades. Here lies one of the factors that contributed to shape the original face of the Moroccan nation, one of the most conservative in the Arab world that was to retain the fundamental features of its personality. While the imperial cities are considered to be jewels of the Moroccan heritage, they don't necessarily represent the sole component of Morocco's history. In fact, the rural villages of the Atlas, as cradles of Berber identity, provided the first models of Moroccan habitat and town planning, the Kasbahs and the Kusurs. It's in the south that the country features the most beautiful specimens of this remarkable clay architecture that was never influenced by the Arab conquest or the development of Spanish Moorish art. This is the valley of the Dra, a Berber land once crossed by long caravans of Moorish merchants that traded fabric, glass beads, and salt for gold, slaves, leather, and pepper. Originally, this habitat was built by nomads who wanted to settle and looked for a type of construction that would be more robust than their wool tents 
in order to resist bad weather and enemies alike. This is why these small fortresses are often set up on a rocky peak or on the edge of a cliff. Isolated and located on a dominant position, they reflected the authority of the Cades, the Sultan's representatives, or of the Pashas, the governors of an imperial city. The Kasbars control the oases and their access roads and served as supply points for those who lived in the desert. Nowadays, and provided they haven't been abandoned, they house public figures or razors. Their construction type follows several architectural rules. Resting on stone foundations, thick walls flanked by four corner towers mark out the construction. The walls are made of rammed earth, a mixture of unbaked clay and hay. This very ancient process is both economical and practical, as it provides heat and cold insulation. Only the ornamentation of the towers and walls allows to differentiate one Kaspar from another. Let's see how the inside of these structures was organized. We're here at the village of Kazba Uled Dris. It's approximately four miles from Mamid, right before you get to Mamid. It's a typically traditional Kazba that was built in 1615. Back in the day, it used to be completely different from today. You had animals on the first floor, the people would live on the second floor, and the roof was reserved for the summer season, as it was very hot. With regard to the rooms that are downstairs, we use them to stock hay, wheat straw, alfalfa, cereals and dates. People sleep in the rooms on the second floor during the winter season. You'll find the same decorations that you see in this house in all the kasurs of the Valley of the Dra. In other words, in the kasurs that are all over the Moroccan south. Usually, there aren't any windows in the kasbahs. There's a patio that lets the light through and serves the role of a window to filter the sun rays. This organization of the habitat was also adopted in the imperial cities, but on a much grander scale. Every king deserves a great city, wrote North African historian Eben Colden in the 14th century. The imperial capitals indisputably represented the heritage of the six Arab and Berber dynasties that ruled over Morocco starting in the 8th century of the Christian era. Located in the heart of an empire that stretched from Andalusia to all of North Africa at its apex, these cities furthered the power and prestige of their sovereigns. Therefore, they needed to be the most perfect expression of the architecture of their time. While their style did evolve based on the sovereign's will, all of the imperial cities nevertheless exhibit the same pattern inspired by Berber and Arab traditions. 
first, they present a dense and compact urban structure between ramparts that are flanked by watchtowers and that feature chicane entrances. Second, the conurbation always develops around the Great Mosque, which represents the cultural and spiritual pole of the urban center. This intricate web consists of calm, quiet, private blind alleys that lead to the houses of noisy, busy, small streets that extend to the neighborhoods. It's also intersected by main roads that connect the gates of the city enclosure. In spite of this apparent jumble, the construction of these cities follows a very specific logic. The minaret of the Great Mosque overlooks the rest of the city. Now the place of worship par excellence, back in the day, the mosque was also a university and a court of justice. It was a convivial space where the duties towards God and men were carried out. The retail area, a muddle of small shops, warehouses and souks, is also remote from the residential districts and follows a hierarchy that goes from the center and extends to the ramparts. The stores that sell luxury goods are located near the mosque. Meanwhile, polluting activities such as tannery are set up on the outskirts and near water points. Besides retail stores and industrial plants, the economic activity features another type of structure. The fondouk or caravansary. It's a large rectangular building surrounding a big open courtyard. On the first floor were the warehouses and shops. The second floor was outfitted with chambers to accommodate merchants. This trading area also featured numerous lavishly decorated fountains, the aspect of which hasn't changed for several centuries. In a hot country more than anywhere else, water distribution is essential to life and the functioning of the cities. In fact, the Quran dictates to offer water to any thirsty man. Such was the organization of public and private life in the heart of the imperial cities. With a rare few exceptions, it remains the same today. At the junction of Moorish Spain and the Arab Orient, the four Sharifian capitals demonstrated exceptional know-how with regard to architectural ornamentation from the early stages of the empire. In the 8th century, 8,000 Arab families that had been driven out of Andalusia by Christian armies settled on the right bank of Fez. A hundred years later, 2,000 families from Kerouan in Tunisia took up residence on the other bank. The newcomers brought along the art and knowledge of the Arab and Andalusian civilizations. Under the reign of the Idrisids, the first university of the Western world was born in the form of al Karawin Mosque. It represents one of the major North African intellectual centers to this day. The construction of this mosque in Fez, along with the Andalusian Mosque, marked the effective beginnings of the Islamic art in Morocco. 
From the 11th to the 13th century, the Almoravid and Almohad dynasties built the first Spanish Moorish empire and gradually emancipated from the influence of the Muslim East. From then on, Moroccan artists and intellectuals no longer relied on Damascus and Baghdad for inspiration, but on Granada and Spain instead. Through the impact of the Andalusian civilization, Fez and Marrakesh became permanent centers of artistic creation. This small edifice that used to shelter the fountain of a mosque is the only remnant of Almoravid art in the former capital of Marrakesh. In the 12th century, the Almohads developed this heritage and built the foundations of an art that their successors would only imitate. The perfection of their constructions and their rich decorative vocabulary marked a new expansion of Spanish Moroccan art. The minaret of the Qutubia, the great mosque of Marrakesh, is a perfect example. The Marinids ruled from the 13th century and resided in Fez and then Rabat. They embellished the cities of the kingdom with a multitude of monuments beautifully decorated with sculpted plaster and wood, a testament to the refinement of Spanish Moorish art. Built in Fez in the 14th century, the Quranic school of Bu Inania ranks among Morocco's most admirable. Following another period of unrest and invasions, a new dynasty ascended to the throne in the 16th century, the Sardians. Their artistic realizations, such as this one in Marrakesh, anchored the continuity of a strongly rooted tradition in Morocco. This architectural complex, where decorative elements abound, was intended to house the tombs of Sardian sovereigns. The Great Sanctuary is a succession of three halls, the central part of which features 12 Carrara marble columns and shelters the grave of King Moulay Ahmed al-Mansur and his heirs. In the middle of the 17th century, the Sardian lineage was replaced by the Alawite dynasty, of which the current king of Morocco, Mohammed VI, is a direct descendant. Sultan Moulay Ismail, the founder of this new Sharifian empire, undertook a series of extravagant constructions in his capital, a gigantic urban ambition that was said to be fueled by his admiration of Louis XIV. In the 17th century, Meknes thus transformed into a mighty citadel reminiscent of Versailles. The implementation of new formulas pertaining to artistic continuity and the massive use of painted wood and enamel ceramic made Alawite art radically exuberant. In parallel to the architecture, an important production of manufactured artifacts developed and a typical custom of Moroccan culture blossomed, henna tattoos. Whether handmade or tattooed, traditional art falls into two major categories, rural and urban. While they each have their standards, they're both nevertheless united through similar graphics. They all stem from architectural elements that were transferred and miniaturized. 
As it enriched itself with numerous additions along the centuries, Moroccan aesthetics developed in parallel to scholarly culture. The craftsmen created an ever more visual world with dizzying geometric and floral compositions that invited the spectators to lose themselves in their endlessness, thus encouraging meditation. There is no better testament to the incredible alchemy of the Moroccan identity than Juma al Fana, the beating heart of imperial Marrakesh. In spite of its name pertaining to the word death, this place of convergence of popular cultures and bustling melting pot of memory, imagination, knowledge and know-how is a must-see celebration of life from here and elsewhere. Now in plain sight, these Moroccan historical artifacts and monuments are still filled with the soul of the craftsman that once built them. Up to recently, the teaching of traditional fine arts in Morocco was carried out through the ancestral practice of companionship. The future craftsmen would join a workshop at a very early age and become initiated to the trade under the tutelage of a master, or malem, on whom he depended entirely. But why? Simply because each stencil has some sort of code, meaning that unless you know that code, you can't recreate the design. This particular code was reserved to the great masters, the melem. The melem was the one who knew the secrets of the trade, he prepared the stencil himself before giving it to the craftsman to carry out the design. It's always a relationship of dependence. The apprentice is constantly connected to his master or his melem. Evidently, the economical state of the traditional enterprise was important. That's why, in order to ensure the confidentiality of his art and the loyalty of the workers he trained, the Marlem would never pass down his know-how in its entirety. Each apprentice was only privy to a single facet of the production chain. The last step of the chain consisted in carving decoration and then applying the stamp of the Marlem on the back of the piece of jewellery. But the corporatis system wasn't the only way to pass down the know-how. This could also be done by the family cooperatives. We're here in the pottery district of Tamgrot, which goes back to the middle of the 16th century. The raw material is clay, which is extracted from the mining galleries located near the valley of the Dra. We break up the clay with a stick and we mix it with water in basins. After that, we lay it on a bed of palm tree branches and we kick it to make it like modeling clay.
Once it's been kneaded, the clay is ready for use. In the coolness of his workshop, the craftsman works the underground turning machine with his feet. This way of working is 500 years old. We learned it from our parents and grandparents, and we improved it over time. That means that no matter the demand, we're able to fulfill it. I started work when I was three. I used to play in the clay, and then my father showed me the ropes. Five p.m. The workers are busy lighting up the ovens, the original design of which dates back to antiquity. The pieces molded earlier that morning are coated with enamel and dried in the sun before being baked twice at a high temperature. The colors are natural and typical of the region. There's brown and green clay. There are about seven or eight stores that are run by various families, each of which comprises between seven and 12 members. Just like pottery, the making of rugs is a very old family activity that is passed down from mother to daughter. However, the initiation to weaving is a tough learning process. Not only does the young apprentice need to assimilate the technical know-how, she also has to memorize the color gamut, the various decorative signs and symbols, as well as the range of compositions. Thanks to this form of writing, the weaver perpetuates an age-old memory, as the rug represents both a way of self-expression and a testament to the struggle against time and oblivion. Nowadays, many craftsmen are self-employed. While most of them handle mass production for the tourism industry, a handful still devote themselves to the manufacture of finely executed pieces. I started working when I was 16. I studied until 1969, after which I quit school and became an apprentice for a Marlem, who was a carpenter. I worked with him until 1972. Abdullah Lakmari later used his skills to help restore the heritage of Marrakesh. In 1973, I started to work for a company right when the royal palaces were being restored. When the manager died, the company was dissolved. We ended up being completely idle. That's when he participated to the restoration of the minbar, or pulpit, of the Kutubia Mosque. This true masterpiece of marquetry made of ivory-encrusted precious wood was built by craftsmen from Cordoba in the 12th century. I was called upon, along with other woodworkers, to restore the minbar. 
That's when I took part in the making of these two pieces. Today, Abdullak struggles to live off his art, as these types of orders are extremely rare. But the economic situation doesn't affect the Art Naji company, located just outside of Fez. Through a relentless activity, this production center perpetuates the tradition of enamel ceramics at an industrial pace. Here we can see all the colors of Fez that come in various motifs. Once it's been baked, the purple color always changes into blue. This is what we call Fez blue. The main ingredient is cobalt. These are mineral colors. These are ancient motifs that date back to the old potteries of the 17th and 18th century. These are polychromic and monochromic designs. The color transformation takes place after the pieces have been baked twice. The reproduction of this famous blue crockery isn't the only ancestral activity of this factory. The marquetry of polychromatic earthenware called zelica continues here as well. First created in the 13th century, zelliga was used to embellish the horizontal and vertical surfaces of the monuments. The production of these mosaics requires several steps. First, the grey clay of Fez needs to dry in the sun before it cuts according to a certain shape based on its future use. Second, the tiles are coated with enamel and put in the oven. The first baking hardens the piece, while the second gives its final color to the enamel. The ultra-high temperature ovens are fueled by a combustible that's been well known since the antiquity, olive paste. The next step consists in drawing patterns of various shapes and sizes on the pieces of earthenware, which are then hand cut. When these tiles are ready, they're assembled piece by piece and inside out according to the configuration of the targeted object before being cemented. Quite a delicate puzzle. So here, of course, we have apprentices in training. It's important to always give them pointers so they can become real artists. The raw materials are clay and the hand of the artists, naturally. My father's approach was very traditional. He never made more than 10 of the same piece. Nowadays, we make thousands of pottery and mosaic pieces. Back in the day, mosaics would only be used to decorate dwellings, such as old houses of the Medina. Today, we make tables, as you can see. We build fountains, we make mirrors. We'll make just about anything in order to please our clients.
We're here at the largest traditional art center in Marrakesh. The idea is first and foremost to preserve the Moroccan heritage and to ensure revenue thanks to the inflow of foreign currency. This is achieved through the export of the items that are displayed here. We have things that are very ancient. There are even antiques that are collected by people who work with us and who bring these artifacts back to us. Certain pieces are also inspired by very old things that were made, evidently, by highly skilled craftsmen, and that aim to preserve our art and our heritage by ensuring continuity and survival. Today, these traditional arts are the foundation of the new creative and learning processes of the arts and crafts schools. Original and ancestral specialities are born and reborn, much like here in Fez, at the palace of Dar El Mokri, where the Institute of Arts and Crafts in Building Trade was created in 1992. The reason this institute was created was to safeguard the occupations that are dying out, such as working with Zelig, for example, the Moroccan mosaic, or plaster sculptures, or even our speciality, the traditional Moroccan painting known as a zoak. We did a comparison between us and the craftsmen of the past. The main difference between our method and the one that was followed previously is the speed. By that, I mean that it used to take 10, 15 years for a father to teach the ropes to his son. Right now, we try to educate our interns through a two-year program, instead of having them stay with a craftsman for five or six years. Another difference is the actual teaching process. Earlier, the melems didn't have the patience to teach all of the trade to the interns. We, on the other hand, teach our students how to decipher the code. This means they have access to the code to carry out any pattern, whether of big or small dimensions. We graduate skilled workers who can then be independent from the craftsmen or even from the melons. In other words, they can do everything from A to Z without the help of an outside source. This year, we've trained four groups with an average of 15 students per group. So that's an average of 60 graduates per year. Earlier, we used to graduate our interns in two years. These students were geared towards the restoration of ancient monuments. Unfortunately, nowadays their training is only six months long because the program's been reduced. Therefore, these interns can't work on the restoration of historical monuments, as this requires people who are a lot more specialized. I'm actually a technician in architecture and town planning. I did my training with old Malems of the Medina along with a few other members of my family. 
I used to study and at the same time, I worked with them on various construction sites. That's how I learned to chisel for a living. Once he's graduated from school, the craftsman is totally free to establish his own business and to reinterpret, renew, and reinvent materials, concepts, shapes, and techniques. This dynamic and this consistency are also present in the field of haute couture. It's in the identity of his country's past that fashion designer Nouradine Amir draws his inspiration. Haute couture has always existed in Morocco. We have an amazing collection of ancient kaftans that date back to the previous centuries. There's a tremendous richness, and I've always been fascinated by that. When I decided to go into fashion design, I figured the idea was to try not to ruin what we had, but rather to keep our traditions. And from there, we could come up with contemporary fashion aimed at renewing the traditional classic piece of clothing. I've traveled a lot, mostly to the south. I've always been highly inspired by the earth and the colors of the south. I work a lot with a material called bizui. It's a material primarily made of wool that's hand-woven, but very finely. There's a region not far from the Marrakesh where they still make this beautiful weaving. The main thing for me is a deeply rooted inspiration with regard to tradition and traditional clothes. Based on that, I create contemporary designs. Moroccan fashion is really multifaceted today. I try to work with a material that evoked the walls of Marrakesh and the walls of Warzazat. From that day on, I started to paint on jute canvases, which are still my favorite, with a technique that's mixed, of course, and which is based on a blend of pigments and sand. I use a lot of ochre and warm colors, of course. They're the true colors of Morocco. In his own way, Ahmed Hajoubi is also trying to transcend the norms through a certain simplicity bursting with force, purity and warmth. In all the paintings of Moroccan artists, you always find traditional traces enhanced with a little modern touch. The reliefs on Moroccan walls, for example, which are somewhat reminiscent of the imperial cities, there's a genuine artistic quest. I personally try to associate tradition with modernization. This is actually contemporary art. Finally, my paintings are not postcards of Morocco. They're artistic works. They're suitable for any country, not just Morocco. Drawn to the texture of the jute canvas that evokes the ruggedness of the walls made of rammed earth and shimmering colors of Moroccan earth, the artist is trying to develop a style of his own in a country where the national identity is strong.
But how does one define the Moroccan artistic culture? I would say that it's not just an alchemy, but rather a mosaic of influences. For these influences still exist today, and they're still being practiced. Therefore, it's a lively culture. One could compare the Moroccan culture to an enormous vase in which several influences have been poured in small doses. Some influences you keep, some influences you reject. But from all of these influences, you can really say that a major culture was born. This age-old intercultural creativity, which notably forged the identity of the kingdom, has yielded the amazing international success enjoyed by the export of traditional and artistic Moroccan production in the last several decades. A poetic justice of some sort.